Thank you for checking out Murder Dictionary Podcast. I just wanted to give a quick disclaimer that we are still learning the ropes of audio and podcasting in general. The sound quality and content will get better as we get more experience, so please bear with us through this learning curve. We focus mostly on the murderers, so some listeners may feel that the subject is approached too lightheartedly and with a lack of focus on the victims. Although we want to be sensitive to that, we cannot help but focus on the details or facts that we find most fascinating. And for us, that is often the life of the murderer and the details of the crimes. We appreciate you checking us out and hope that you are also interested in the stories that we are intrigued enough by to explore. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and don't forget to subscribe on iTunes. And now, a thought from Geico Motorcycle. It took 15 minutes to take a spirit animal quiz online. Please be the cheetah. Please be the cheetah. And learn your animal isn't the cheetah, but the far less appealing blobfish. Oh, come on. To add insult to injury, you could have used those 15 blobfish minutes to switch your motorcycle insurance to Geico. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on motorcycle insurance. Thank you for checking out Murder Dictionary Podcast. Before we start, I just wanted to let you know to check out our Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. We're pretty much everywhere. Back page, all that good business. That's my favorite. <laughs> That's where you can find Kelly. <laughs> my name is Brianna and with me is Kelly. Hey. So today our subject is going to be double lives. There's a lot of people that have double lives like BTK and Iceman. But we're going to look at some cases that maybe are a little lesser known. Gerard John Schaefer was born in Wisconsin on March 25th, 1946. The oldest of three children in a family he described as turbulent and full of conflict. In adulthood, he referred to himself as an illegitimate child, the product of a hasty shotgun wedding. You don't hear about shotgun weddings enough <laughs> anymore. <laughs> I mean, are there shotguns there? Or is it just quick? Is, it, is that what they mean? Like... I is it because of the waiting period for guns? Or? <laughs> <laughs> he describes his father as a verbally abusive alcoholic, flagrantly adulterous, and often absent from home on business trips or otherwise. Yeah, quote, business trips. Yeah. <laughs> Busy business down. trips to this hotel with a girl. <laughs> yeah. Business trip to the bar. Right. Then to the hotel. <laughs> um, by 1960, Schaefer's family had settled in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. He graduated in high school there in 1964, and he was working on the first of several college degrees when his parents divorced. Seems like all these guys were, like, really, I mean, they had, like, good college degrees, or they right. were in the military and had college degrees. Like, And that's part of the duality, I yeah, think. Like, norm, early yeah. in life, they develop this thing where they need to keep up appearances, and they need to, like, go to the good school mm -hmm. and get married, and, and then later on, they're like, oh, yeah, no, I really want to do something else that's awful. Yeah. Yeah. But they do. It does stem from that that feeling of needing to put on these false pretenses or something. I don't know. Why are you fronting? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's the name of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> he graduated high school there in 1964, and he was working on the first of several college degrees. And his parents divorced. In his teens, Schaefer became obsessed with women's panties and also became a peeping tom, spying on a neighbor girl named Lee Hainline. He would later admit to killing animals in his youth and also cross-dressing, although at other times he claimed the latter was solely to avoid the draft into the Vietnam War, which he, he escaped the, the draft, so... Yeah, it, it worked. worked. Yeah. <laughs> Psychiatrist said he had numerous sexual hang-ups from a very early age. Yeah, how do you have sexual hang-ups at an early age? I'm confused how about that. How young are we talking? Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not sure, but yeah. I mean, that's crazy. 
Maybe he was just rubbing his dick on everything. I don't know. I was like seven years old, humping things constantly. Everything humping the school desk. Yeah. Okay. So he began to experiment with bondage and sadomasochism at the age of twelve. He was quoted as saying, "I tie myself up to a tree, then I get excited sexually and do something to hurt myself." Maybe he just scratched his back like Baloo from the Jungle Book, <laughs> doing little bear stuff. Yeah, but that's I mean, twelve. Yeah, that is 12 young. Twelve is so. young. Like I hadn't even kissed someone at twelve. You know what I mean? Oh, I was full on jerking at twelve. Oh, no. What are you doing? Are you serious? Yeah, dude. Oh my god, I'm such. What a is it like sixth grade? Yeah, no, no, maybe fifth grade. Kelly, what <laughs> is that wrong? I need to call your dad. I, no, don't. What are you going <laughs> to tell him? What are you going to rat me out? Oh I'm my God. sad for baby Kelly right now. That's I, so young. I knew girls that used to like rub their vaginas on things all the time when they were younger. I mean, but on that's like different couch. than jerking someone off. I was jerking myself off. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Oh, you thought it was... You thought, you thought baby Kelly was fucking jerking people I off at baby 10. Kelly was super sexual with other people. Oh, and I was like, no. baby Kelly, I want to hug you that you don't have to do that. Wait, what age did you say you jerked someone off at? Oh, no. You like said 12? Old. Oh, no, okay. no, no, no. I was like, I didn't touch a penis. I ran from a penis at 14. Yeah, I was saying I hadn't even kissed anybody at 12. Kiss, like, that's no, what she said. Like, not at all. Not jerked. Yeah, I, I misunderstood. I'm sorry yeah. I assumed you were a gnarly 12-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're allowed to jerk off at 12, you know? You might have that been reading sense. about me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> this <Probably>. is you. <laughs> so... Around the same time, he said he began to masturbate while fantasizing about hurting people, women in particular. Schaefer wanted to hurt himself. As if this weren't enough, Schaefer recalled, I discovered win- women's underwear and said he'd sometimes put them on. Yeah, but he's cross-dressing just for the draft. You know, yeah. like, I think he just needs to be honest. I I don't know. Just be honest about it. Like, it's, it's well, cool. Uh, yeah. Well, so maybe it wasn't just, that was a front, too, because he just said he discovered women's underwear at the age right. of whatever. So he liked that shit way before the draft. Dude. He you, knew. You get drafted at 18. You had six years. To just wear nothing but women's panties. Yeah. I yeah. wonder if he liked booty shorts or thongs. <laughs> <laughs> like what kind of style whale tails yeah he's a granny panty dude i can Coats. already feel it super granny he's panty. there for the comfort <laughs> Schaefer claimed the origin of his self-loathing was that his father favored his sister so he wanted to be a girl he felt like a disappointment to his family and thought his parents loved him less than his sister they probably did because he was fucking cross-dressing all the time <laughs> and tying himself to trees and just do it i mean it's not the cross-dressing. It's all the other scary shit. Yeah. Burning things. Wasn't that a mm-hmm. thing? Or animals? I can't yeah. remember. He Ugh. said, I wanted to die. I couldn't please my father, so I wanted to be killed. You still have a mom. Like, I, You still be? have so many other people. Yeah, your sister. I mean, I love my dad, but if he didn't like me, I'd find someone else to like yeah. me. <laughs> What's up, bro? What's up, cousin? What's Can you up, be my dad? <laughs> yeah. Thanks, adopted dad. <laughs> Schaefer claimed to have visited a psychiatrist in 1966, seeking relief from his sexual deviance and homicidal fantasies, but therapy didn't help. He has stated that he kept on hearing voices telling him to kill. That same year, he toured the South with Moral Rearmament Church. Schaefer thought of the priesthood as, as a divine calling, but he was turned away from the seminary because he didn't have enough faith. The rejection angered Schaefer so much that he quit the Catholic Church entirely. I mean, you dodged a bullet. He's just yeah. looking at it wrong. But he was rejected by his father, and yeah. now he's rejected by the church. <sighs> I know, but it's just like, I just, I hate the church. <laughs> okay, sorry. Move on. <laughs> the Catholic church. Um, his next goal was a teaching job because he hoped to instill American values like honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love. Since when is unselfishness a American Opposite. value? Come well, on. back in 19 fucking 66, probably. Yeah, no. Oh, wait, no. Yeah, no. We were way. super selfish. We, you know what? We were dicks. We were selfish with think with thinking we were unselfish. You mm. know, like we kind of still are now. Like we <laughs> fucking were the ca- again Captain Save a Hose of right? all of, of the world. <laughs> so, um, his next goal was a teaching job because he hoped to instill American values like honesty, purity, and selfishness and love. But Schaefer was twice dropped from student teaching programs for trying to impose his own moral and political values on his students. Schaefer was soon fired for what was referred to as totally inappropriate behavior, according to the principal. In 1968, Schaefer married Martha Fogg, but it didn't work out. Martha filed for divorce in May 1970, claiming extreme cruelty. Schaefer took a few weeks to recuperate in Europe and North Africa that summer, coming home with a new goal in life. 
If he couldn't be a priest or a teacher, he would be a policeman. That's really common with murderers, too. Just they wanted, that they to, be wanted to be policemen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's again, it's kind of like that God complex. Like, yeah. you're just in charge. It's or just control. Control, or, yeah. Yeah. Uh, or believing that power. everybody in the world is crappy, so mm-hmm. you have to do something about it. Yeah. And you're the hero. Like, right. You really are. And for someone who's been rejected their whole life, I mean, someone that's thought of as a hero doing like service for everyone right. every day that would be like your goal like it's a great dream. way to get people's approval and mm-hmm. gratitude and all constantly sorts of stuff. you get yeah. discounts when you go out to chili's <laughs> free you know? starbucks yeah mm-hmm. he applied to several departments but was always rejected after failing the psychological test however the small wilton manners police department hired him anyway Oof. they must have been severely understaffed <laughs> big mistake march 1972 schaefer earned a commendation for his role in a drug bust. One month later, on April 20th, he was fired, which I think is funny because he helped in a drug bust and then he was fired on 420. (laughs) (laughs) Stupid. (laughs) Maybe he did it on purpose. (laughs) Explanations vary. Chief Bernard Scott later said that Schaefer didn't have an ounce of common sense. Might have had an ounce of weed, (laughs) ounce of cocaine. (laughs) While FBI agents reports that Schaefer was disciplined for running female traffic violators through the department's computer, obtaining personal information, and later calling them for dates. Gross. Oh, my God. What a creep. Well, I mean, you don't have, um, what is that called? Tinder and shit like that. Right, yeah. This is his version of Facebook. Yeah. He's like, I'm going to call all these ladies. I'm going to slide into their DMs by just following them home. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so whatever the cause of his firing, Schaefer found himself once again in need of a job. In June, he signed on with the Martin County Sheriff's Department and relocated to Stewart, Florida. Of course, Florida. Florida. Every time. No fucking background checks, dude. Right? What? This is I can understand for 1864 with the references. That yeah. makes sense to me. But yeah. it's fucking 1966. They can call. They right. can call any Absolutely. of the references. I feel like maybe once they pass the background check once, even if they were fired and had something negative like on their jacket, they still maybe the ref or the hiring carries over or something like passing the check carries over. Yeah. I don't know that for sure, but that's just a theory I have. Yeah. Like, but a police maybe department that was and a case. sheriff are two different one, mm. you know, one works for the, you know, state and what, I don't know, but they're two different things. You would think there'd yeah. be two different, two different psychological tests. Right. Yeah, you're right. I, I guess w- that they, it seems like they may need to pass another exam. How did he slip through the cracks? I don't even. I, I say that every time I, I research these murders. I'm like, how did this go unnoticed? It doesn't make sense. Oh. He had been on the job less than a month when he made a dumb mistake that would cost him his career and his freedom. On July 21st, 1972, Schaefer picked up two hitchhikers, 17-year-old Pamela Wells and 18-year-old Nancy Trotter, on the highway near a local beach. He lied and told them that hitchhiking was illegal in Martin County and drove them back to a halfway house where they were staying. Wouldn't you just get a ticket? Like, yeah, I know, right? What? Like, okay, I don't need to be taken down to the station. What the fuck? Yeah. Um, so Schaefer offered to meet them the next morning off-duty and drive them to the beach himself. The girls agreed, but instead of taking them to the beach on July 22nd, Schaefer drove them to a remote area. Of course. What, I just... I hate to victim blame, and I really hate it. And I guess in that situation, people do trust people in the 70s. Yeah. That makes sense. But again, now, I, we just wouldn't do it. Right? right. And also, it's like, he's got the uniform. There's a he lot trusts. of studies on how you can trust someone in a uniform mm-hmm. or a doctor because they're wearing a white coat. Like, there's a certain thing that it evokes in you that you just trust it. And uh, that's just so awful. You shouldn't. You shouldn't Mm-mm. trust no one. Like, Mm-mm. just question especially it, especially off duty. If he's just like, let's hang out off duty. No, that's the weird. No. It, like, and they were just trying to go to the beach, get yeah. their tan on. Like, uh, that's fucked up. Uh, yeah. He, so now they're at this remote area, basically, and mm-hmm. um, he started making sexual remarks, and then drew a gun and told them that he had planned to sell them as white slaves to a foreign prostitution syndicate. Jesus. Which also shows you how long foreign prostitution syndicates have been going on. That's 50 <laughs> years ago, dude. 50 right. years ago, that was a big thing. Yeah. And it was a real thing. And that shit, people are getting snatched up all the time. And Prostitution's uh, the oldest profession. 
So yeah, so he thought he was going to sell them to a prostitution syndicate. Forcing them out of the car, he bound both girls and left them balanced on tree roots with nooses around their necks. So there was a risk of hanging, like, if they slipped and fell off yeah. the... Which is fucking terrible. Like, because especially because if you're bound, like, you don't want to move and you're right. just like... You're like, I want to try and get out of this, but if I struggle too hard, I am going to die. Yeah, if you slip and you try and get oh. out of it and you slip and fall, one wrong move, you're just cracked your neck. Like, that's... Oh my God, that's my horrific. anxiety. He's like, me, yeah, that's right. Just, I'm like, Ugh. yeah, and you know, you don't know if it's like on a tree root that's cut down perfectly. It could just right. be fucking ants everywhere. Like, Schaefer left them and promised to return shortly. The girls escaped in his absence and ran to the highway, where they flagged down a passing police car. God, thank God. Which I would have fucking tripped if it would have been him. Right? Oh my that god. That would have been the scariest Can thing ever. Can you imagine ever. they see a police car coming and they're just like, um, did he come back in the police vehicle? I would have <gasps> just, no, like, been like, no, fuck the cops. Like, right, I'll just wait run the, the next- other direction. Mm. That's brave as shit to yeah. just stand there and let the police car turn, like, pull over and get them. Like, let's oh hope it's god. not him. Yeah. They had no problem identifying their assailants since Schaefer had told them his name. He was really confident that he yeah. could get away with it. All right, so by that time, Schaefer discovered their escape and telephoned his boss, Sheriff. Of Richard Crowder. Schaefer told his boss, I've done something foolish. You're going to be mad at me. Yeah, it sounds like he's talking. That's daddy issues it's a, right yeah, you're there. Like, your come dad. on. Ooh. Yeah, that's your boss. Just talk to them with some sort of respect. That's crazy. Just say, I quit. <laughs> this is my two weeks notice i murdered my bad i quit so <laughs> he said he had overdone his job while trying to scare the girls out of hitchhiking in the future for their own good that's uh, that makes me straight. so mad yeah you uh, fucking dick yeah he was fired on the spot charged with false imprisonment and two counts of aggravated assault Schaefer was released on a fifteen thousand dollar bond. That's too little. He tried to Way kill these girls. He did. He let he could nooses have. He around could have, their neck. They could have died when he was away and they were in the nooses. Mm-hmm. They could have died. Yeah. Ugh. He, he didn't get attempted murder. No, he didn't. No. No, just False aggravated imprisonment. assault. Yeah. No. Oh my god. Yeah, that's awful. Fuck. So at trial in November 1972, he pled guilty on one assault charge and the other accounts were dropped. Like, that doesn't even... There's two girls Mm -hmm. and only one assault charge went through. That's... Yep. Fucking unbelievable. I, the system, it's just, I <sighs> read these things. System. And it's also, he's a police officer, a white dude. Yeah. Like, that yep. just is infuriating mm-hmm. to me. So Judge D.C. Smith called Schaefer a thoughtless fool and sentenced him to a year in county jail to be followed by three years probation. The ex-deputy began serving a sentence on January 15th, 1973. Which I hope prison was rough for you because you're an ex-cop. Right? What are they going to do to you? You're All the cop. other prisoners are just like, mm, we're going to get him. Mm-hmm. Fish, fish, fish. <laughs> like, oh man, that'd be good. So the most shocking revelations were yet to come, however. Two other girls are missing from the neighborhood. And they would not be as lucky as the surviving Trotter and Wells. On September 27, 1972, while Schaefer was free on bond pending trial, 17-year-old Susan Place and 16-year-old Georgia Jessup had vanished from Fort Lauderdale. Susan's parents said the girls were last seen at her house, leaving with an older man named Jerry Shepard on their way to play guitar at a nearby beach. They never came back, but Lucille Place had noted Schaefer's license number, along with a description of his blue-green Datsun. Which, if you're already, like, kind of worried, like, to where you have to write down their license yeah, plate Yeah, I feel number, like you would do something more than that and just be like, hey, girls, you're grounded. You know what? Right yeah. <laughs> um, you need to come inside and help me with something. Yeah. So. But, I mean, again, you, you I just don't everyone. want a victim blame, and no. I understand in the time that they were more trusting but that's just in hindsight it seems so much yeah maybe she was a cool mom she didn't want to right she's like i just want to be chill with the kids of course you can come back just be home by 12 it was march 25th 1973 before sluggish investigators traced the plate number back to schaefer by which time he was already in jail for assaulting teenage girls so it was september to march is till when they even looked up his license plate number yeah that is crazy to me (sighs) i don't understand how that happened they have the license they ha- number. it's just so easy i understand they didn't have the kind of computer systems mm-hmm. and databases that we have now but there's got to be a way to trace that better especially it's not like a simple like hit and run case i can understand those being deprioritized yeah but this is two missing girls that you have to presume are dead you think that would be a priority mm-hmm. and that they would get on that a little bit quicker probably not damn 
So Schaefer denied any contact with Place and Jessup, but the case began unraveling on April 1st, 1973, when skeletal remains are found on Hutchinson Island by three men collecting aluminum cans. Four days later, the victims were identified from dental records. Detectives said that the evidence from the crime scene indicated the two girls were tied to a tree and butchered. Susan Place's cause of death was being shot in the jaw. On April 7th, police searched the home of Schaefer's mother, where Gerard had personal items stored in a spare bedroom. Evidence recovered in the search included trophies of women's jewelry, a journal of writing and sketches depicting mutilation and murders of young women, newspaper clippings about missing women, and an ID belonging to the vanished hitchhikers Colette Goodenow and Barbara Wilcox, both 19. The two girls had last been seen alive on January 8th, and while their skeletal remains were found in early 1977, no cause of death could be determined, so no charges were filed. Again, oh my god. He has their shit in his house yes he's known oh and it's two girls you know bound or whatever it's just it's just crimes that white people commit crimes against women they're just not taken as seriously and of course the combination a white dude just you know some missing girls that happen to be last seen with him they're not gonna take it as seriously and that's absolutely awful yeah and if you can't find a cause of death then basically there's no then you know that they're dead like you know that's all you need you don't need a cause of death just be like like, hey, these two girls were seen with you. You have their shit. Yeah. You murdered them. We dug them up. They didn't die of natural causes. Right. It was obviously a murder. So how could you not pursue, I mean, a yeah. murder? Maybe there was enough evidence. It's just not good enough. You know, yep. I just don't Try understand again. that. One of the news clips found referred to the February 1969 disappearance of waitress Carmen Halleck, seemingly abducted from her home. Items of her jewelry were found in Schaefer's storage, along with a gold-filled tooth identified as Halleck's, but once again, no charges were filed. It's her fucking tooth. I, it's just, this story is just heart-wrenching. I is hate this it Wisconsin? so much. Is this Wisconsin? Oh, no, it's Lauder- it fucking Fort Lauderdale. This is you remember Florida. Florida. <laughs> fucking Florida. <sighs> the second missing woman, Lee Bonadies, had been a neighbor of Schaefer's when she disappeared in ne- September of 1969. He complained of her taunting him by undressing her with her curtains open, and a piece of her jewelry was found among his belongings, but no charges were filed when her skeletal remains were finally recovered in 1978. It's just so awful, and so many women are dying because no charges are being filed. Like, why even look for the remains? I mean, just to know that they're dead? Why bother? Jesus. If we're not going to do anything, like... (sighs) So mad at that. <laughs> More jewelry linked Schaefer to the disappearance of 14-year-old Mary Briscolina, who vanished from Broward County with 13-year-old Elsie Farmer in October 1972. These ones are younger. I this know. Is even, ugh. Their skeletons were found in early 1973, but once again, no cause of death could be determined, and no charges were fucking filed. Just again and again. It's like the fourth time. Seriously. I know. The list of suspected victims would grow over time, but Schaefer faced charges in only two murders. He was indicted on May 18, 1973, for the slayings of Jessup and Place. He was convicted on two counts of first-degree murder in October 1973 and was sentenced to concurrent terms of life imprisonment. Numerous appeals, about 20, were rejected and denied. Schaefer later said that he disagreed with the supposed body count of 34. He claimed to have recounted a list of my own and said, As I recall, my list runs between 80 and 110. But over eight years in three continents, one whore drowned in her own vomit while watching me disembowel her girlfriend. I'm not sure that counts as a valid kill. Did the pregnant ones count as two kills? It can get confusing. Ah, that <laughs> is so awful. Oh my God. I hate this guy. You. This episode is going to be called I Hate This Guy. Yeah. Because <laughs> every one of these dudes, I'm just like, what a fucking asshole. I hate him. It's like a scene from an Eli Roth movie, dude. Yes. Like a girl drowned in her own vomit while watching him disembowel her friend. It's just horrific. It's so awful. And do the pregnant ladies count as two? That's just. Of course they count as two. Uh. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but yeah, that's just so fucking. I'm getting murdered for two. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. So that's <laughs> I'm cutting that out. That's awful. <laughs> oh my god, he's terrible. Okay, so Schaefer's luck ran out. His, I gotta say, he does. He's a lucky, lucky, lucky dude. bastard. So lucky. 
Shaver's luck ran out on December 3rd, 1995, when another inmate barged into his cell, slashed that motherfucker's throat, Hell and then yeah. stabbed him in both eyes. Of course. Good job. Blat, blat. <laughs> Just stab, stab. Prison officials named the killer as inmate Vincent Rivera, serving life plus 20 years for two murders in Tampa, but no specific motive has been offered. I mean, the guy being a complete piece of shit yeah. that murdered a bunch of women um, and kids, kids is enough of a motive. Yep. Like, I can understand that. It appears that Schaefer's reputation as a rat and troublemaker in the joint caught up with him, but I really think it's probably because it was so many kids so and women. So many, yeah. They're, they're just, you know, baby girls. I like, know. That's, that's a no-no in jail. That's yeah. That's not good. Just like calling someone a bitch or being a snitch. There's so many no-nos in jail, mm-hmm. and he did a lot of he them, did, apparently. Yeah. So ex-FBI agent Bill Haggerty called him one of the sickest, illest. (laughs) (laughs) Just kidding. Uh, One of the sickest. If I had a list, which would include all of the serial killers I have interviewed throughout the country, he would definitely be in the top five. The victim's mother, Shirley Jessup, said Schaefer's murder was simply a case of overdue justice. I like to send a present to the guy who killed him, she told reporters. I've always believed that he was going to get his. I just wish it would have been sooner than later. Yeah, it's totally overdue justice. That's just, I can't yeah. believe that case went on for so long. And there was just no time that he was convicted of all these things. Again, as a survivor or a family member, how devastating would it be that he wouldn't get sentenced or convicted of yeah. murdering your family member, your loved one? Uh, it's just... And I wonder, Crazy. They, I wonder if they found anyone else because it says no charges are filed. So did they just give up? Did they just yeah, search I just, for other people? Were these cases ever solved? Because, and once he died, of course, it would just be a moot point. They would just mm-hmm. forget about they it. Don't care but anymore. it's still, for so long, he got away with so much. Fucking lucky bastard. Uh, what a- I'm glad he got stabbed in the eyeballs. Like, <laughs> fuck, yes. Yeah, and- I'd like to go on record by saying that I just hate him, and I'm glad he got, you know, stabbed in the eyeballs. He deserved it. I hope it was with, like, a crazy prison shank, too. So he had to, like, pull one eyeball out and then stab the other one. Maybe, like, maybe it was, like, a martini, like, you know, like, oh my God. Olive, where he stabbed one and one was uh, stuck on there, and then he stabbed. Oh, I don't, it's not, uh, this is good. You don't uh, even know? I get grossed out really Do easily. Do you really? I- yeah. I just want to see this. I, I'm sorry. I get grossed out really yeah. easily. Uh, okay. But yeah, he deserves all of that. Yeah. I just can't picture it. Like, I can't hear about it because then I picture it. Yeah, you that's the way my brain works. Martini olives. No, that's a No bad. thanks. Yeah. I bought martini olives. I'll pass. <laughs> <laughs> so even though our next criminal is not a murderer, he was still living an extreme double life. So his private persona really didn't match up with his public presentation of self and what he did in the media. Yeah, totally opposite. So I know it's not our murder and, you know, technically we're murder dictionary. But Mm -hmm. again, I hate this guy so much that I had to include him. (laughs) Like really, even though he didn't qualify as a murderer, I was like, I fucking hate this guy. I got to I got to just talk about it. So basically, this is just therapy for me about how much I hate this guy. Um, Which is what they want too, right? Like, don't they uh, want that? They're like, oh, we want to be talked about. And- yeah, like some sort of fame or whatever. Mm-hmm. I I don't know if the no- the negative attention mm-hmm. is necessarily oh, their true. thing, but just being famous, yeah. I think I don't know, is I enough hope- for a lot of these guys. I hope he gets this guy gets his eyeball stabbed. Oh. <laughs> I really <laughs> Me do. Me too. I hate this guy. So Eddie Long attended North Carolina Central University in Durham, North Carolina, where he received a bachelor's degree in business administration in 1970. Everyone has a degree. Yeah, every single yeah, one of these people. Yeah, they're all really they're educated mm-hmm. people. Every one of these double life cases. Again, I think that just like the last cases when we talked about it, I feel like they felt they had to overachieve. Yeah, they had to like do big things, lead a normal life, and it's didn't work out. I'm dropping out of college. <laughs> <laughs> That's safe because then you yeah. won't become a murderer. Yeah. <laughs> Long claims to hold a doctorate in pastoral ministry from the unaccredited International College of Excellence, which is not recognized by either the Council for Higher Education accreditation or the United States Department of Education. Fake, 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 fake. Super fake. I think um, Wayne and Garth went to the College of <laughs> Excellence. <laughs> Stupid. Either that or Bill and Ted. Yes, yes. <laughs> One of the two. That's why it's fictional. It's totally fictional. 
He went on to work as a factory sales representative for Ford Motor Corporation, but was fired after he submitted expense reports for reimbursement that included personal expenses, quote, Mm. like hookers and cocaine. (laughs) That's the only explanation. (laughs) Write that off. Write that off. And Susie. Charge it to the (laughs) I'll use my business card. (laughs) Following his dismissal from Ford, he moved to Atlanta to study theology and become the pastor of a small Jonesboro, Georgia church. Long married Deborah Houston in 1981, and they were divorced soon after they had a son together. Houston said she was the victim of cruel treatment and was afraid of Long's violent and vicious temper. Again, that was from one of the previous cases, too. Mm -hmm. It's just in the home, they're vicious. She and her son allegedly had to flee the couple's Fairburn home because their safety was threatened. Long vigorously denied the allegations, and in 1985, Houston was awarded custody of their then two-year-old son. Subsequently, Long remarried Vanessa Griffin in 1990. In 1987, he became the pastor of New Birth Missionary Baptist Church. That combines a lot of words that I don't like, (laughs) which at the time had around 300 members. I like missionary. (laughs) I prefer doggy, but (laughs) you're finding the bright side. (laughs) Under Long's ministry, membership grew to 25,000. So when he started 300, then grew it to 25,000. He fucking killed it. Yeah. Again, these ambitious. Yep. Driven, Driven, and it just speaks to how well they can lie, Mm -hmm. too, I think. They just can tell. They're like used car salespeople. Mm -hmm. Like, they're just telling everybody what they want to hear, talking Mm -hmm. themselves up, making it seem like they're the shit, Mm -hmm. and people will follow. And he was a factory sales representative for the Ford. Right? Like, that makes (laughs) Makes perfect sense. sense. Yeah. Long was given the title of bishop in the Full Gospel Baptist Church Fellowship, a group of black Baptist church that embraced Pentecostal practices. What's Pentecostal? I seriously knew you were going to ask me that. As I was saying it, I was like, I don't know what this is. (laughs) I'm going to fucking Google it. It's got to be like... Is it the one where they speak in tongues? Where the the power of Christ compels them? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah, you're right. Speaking in tongues, prophecy, healing, and exorcism. That's what I thought it was. But I'm always afraid when I think that I know something, I'm like, don't say it out loud. You're going to be wrong, you stupid fuck. You're so smart. You're fucking (laughs) smart. I always question myself. That's so crazy. God damn. On August 28th, 2005, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution reported that during the period between 1997 and 2000, Long received more than $3.07 million worth of compensation and benefits from his supposedly non-profit charity. The fucking religion, there are no taxes. Yes. Non-profit charity. That's just charity. insane. It's just such a, it's such a con. I just feel like religion is just mm-hmm. so full of shit. They're just collecting all this money. Mm-hmm. It's just about greed. Long contended that the charity did not solicit donations from members, but instead gained its income from royalties, speaking fees, and several large donations. Long did not cooperate with the investigation, including refusing to disclose his salary. An investigation was launched into the tax-exempt status of six ministries under the leadership. The outcome of the three-year investigation was that there was no definitive findings of wrongdoing. (laughs) And the pastors who refused to cooperate received no penalties. It's like, oh, you're religious. We'll let you pass just so I can be good with God. You know how you um, were saying the thing about the Star Wars when you read that word? Um, I just see pastor. (laughs) And I guess it makes me hungry when I read about pastors. I want some tacos. (laughs) Oh, man. But no penalties. Again, this guy's lucky and just slips. Just getting away with things. Yeah. You have a position of power. People kind of respect you and look up to you and you get away with this fucking. That's just so awful. (sighs) Long sermons, writings, and teachings empathize respect, submission, and obedience. Long sees the first link in that chain as teaching man to be respectful, submissive, and obedient to God. Subordinate to man, women were taught to be respectful, submissive, and obedient to their father and or husbands. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Totally. (laughs) To live otherwise is to be outside of the divinely established order and will result in the loss of spiritual and natural benefits. 
I'm good. Yeah. Uh, I'll pass. Yeah, no thanks. Do I get to choose what I want to watch on TV? Right. <laughs> Can I wear what I that. want? Yeah. <laughs> I don't have to do your dishes and cook your dinner. Right. I'll pass. <laughs> Part of Long's teachings in ministry was also frequently denouncing homosexual behavior. Long has ministered homosexual cure programs to recruit gays and lesbians for what he called sexual reorientation conferences, and his church offered an ongoing out-of-the-wilderness ministry to help convert homosexuals into heterosexuals. Pray the gay way. Ooh, God. And he, they probably shouldn't use, like, out of anything. <laughs> and, like, That's just mean. Coming out of the wilderness. That's like, so mean. Yeah. We're going to take your saying and your activities and make it our own. Mm-hmm. Gross, dude. Yeah. In 2004, Long led a march and protest against same-sex marriage in support of a national constitutional amendment to limit marriage rights to one man and one woman. A 2007 article in the Southern Poverty Law Center's magazine called him one of the most homophobic black leaders in the religiously based anti-gay movement. I bet she's gay. Girl, <laughs> let me real. tell you. He's not gay, but he would definitely go into a sex shop and buy a strap on, which is like, <laughs> with his boo. And be like, I'm not gay. I just like it. Like Finger in the booty ass bitch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's not gay, but it's, no. I mean, it's open. But for someone that's homophobic, yeah, it is. It is anything. Yeah. It's just anything, even remotely, is just ho- it's just gay. Butts are for pooping. <laughs> <laughs> Long was a prominent supporter of George W. Bush's faith-based initiatives. His ministry received one million dollar grant from the U.S. Administration of Children and Families. In December 2010, Vanessa Long filed for divorce from Bishop Eddie Long. On the same day, New Birth Church's public relations firm claimed that she had rethought her decision and would withdraw her divorce filing. The statement given said, Upon further prayerful reflection, Vanessa Long is withdrawing the divorce petition. However, Vanessa's attorneys soon confirmed that she would continue with the divorce. Then on September 5th, 2012, the divorce possibility flip-flopped again. Vanessa Long stated that while she struggled with the decision to divorce Eddie following multiple accusations of sexual misconduct, she ultimately chose to return to her marriage and to the New Birth Church family so she could share her experience and offer guidance for this. What? I know. Just keeping it it's, together for the church. Yeah. And, and sucks. to me, it sounds like she was threatened or coerced or yeah. paid off or something like that. Yeah. And who's going to want to divorce the pastor? You are going to be ostracized from your right. church. Like, your entire run community yeah. is gone mm-hmm. in an instant. But on top of that, I think it's deeper than that. I think the possibility of that is awful. But also, I think there's got to be money or threats or mm-hmm. something involved. That's the only thing that makes sense for it to be going back and forth like that. He's making millions. Oh, God. So the sexual misconduct that Vanessa was talking about, citing in her divorce, uh, no, nope. <laughs> <laughs> so the sexual misconduct that Vanessa was referring to in her statements about possibly divorcing him was the rumor or proof or whatever that he had exploited five fatherless boys in his church that he had sexual relationships mm. with in like approximately 2010 could have guessed it church, yeah of I course boys, yeah because you're doing all this you know reorientation you're just going way too far on the gay thing yeah way too yeah, far seriously yeah exactly. it's just it has to be internal homophobia there's no reason to be that hateful So Maurice Robinson, Anthony Flagg, Jamal Paris, and Spencer Legrand filed separate lawsuits alleging that Long used his pastoral influence to coerce them into a sexual relationship with him. The accusers said that Long manipulated them since childhood under the guise of providing a fatherly influence, but quickly escalated to coerce sexual relationships as soon as the boys reached the legal age of consent. So he was, I mean, in, of course, the true crime world, they call that grooming. So he had, yeah. like, picked out these victims mm-hmm. years in advance and like, gained their trust and placed himself as a father figure mm-hmm. and asserted himself into their lives mm-hmm. and then 
completely turn that around against them. People have so much influence over kids. And yeah. like, you gotta be careful who you leave your kids with, but you always think again, cause it's that person in uniform or whatever. Yeah. A, a pastor. The pastor is just gonna be trustworthy. But yeah. that's not the case. You it's, think in the 2000s, like, I would not be sending would know my better. kids to any pastor time. Like, there's gotta right. be a nun present or right. something like just like nurses have to be there with doctors right you know, when they're doing paps <laughs> we need we need yeah that fucking, seriously yeah, that nun there because this is not yeah the track record is really bad yeah it's awful the sexual relationships all began when the boys reached 17 years old and because the age of consent in georgia is 16 police could not pursue criminal charges wait so, so he's is- it was so premeditated he had groomed them and then waited specifically until they were the legal age of consent. So basically, even if he gave them unwanted sexual attention, just because they're of legal consent age, did, did that mean they consented? I mean, I think that... Do you see what I mean? I mean, like, I don't know if they specifically consented every time, but I think that he really carried on relationships with them. Oh. I mean, full relationships. It I wasn't like, even a molestation thing. No, it wasn't forcing... But it's rape. It's yeah, rape. it wasn't forcing the sexual acts, I don't think. No, he just, it like you said, like, groomed them. Exactly. And they trusted that was, him. Exactly. And he's taught them well until this point, Like, yeah. right? So why wouldn't you trust him? Yeah, I don't think that it was a rape situation where they actually had said no. I think that they just realized eventually that they were influenced so heavily by him that it wasn't really of their own free will anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, because they had put him in such a high place in their mind that, he, of course, he abused that. That was Ugh. abusive, you know? I really fucking hate this guy. Yeah. I, that's why I had to include mm-hmm. him. I know he's not a murderer, but... Uh, he had to be in here for double lives for he sure. Murdered these kids like childhood. Yes, like, for real. That's oh, so awful. The victims state that Long placed all the boys on the church's payroll. He bought them cars, clothes, and other gifts, and took them separately on lavish trips to destinations like Kenya, South Africa, Trinidad, Honduras, New Zealand, and New York. Oh, they're like Instagram models you know? <laughs> showing up on some yacht and shit. Like. You can imagine these boys with their duck lips. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's not funny, but still, like, that sucks. But like, I can yeah, see why they crazy. rolled with it. They're like, do I suck a dick, you know, and get my check? and then Or I- do I just go home and live a boring life? Yeah, and get kicked out and all my homies did it. Like, right. Oh, yeah, it's fuck. just so it's so abusive on so many levels. Like he knows that he can do that by giving them all these things. You have no other option. It seems yeah. like like you have to because he's worked for years to yeah. get your trust. And it's like when he says, "Let's go to South Africa," like you're yeah. like, "I want to go to South of Africa." Course. I'm fucking seventeen. Of course, I want to. Yes, and Kenya, and Trinidad, right. and Honduras, New Zealand, and New York. I suck just... a dick to go to New York. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe not New York, but definitely New, New Zealand. In Trinidad, for sure. So, I mean, do you want to stop and we'll just make a list of all the places you would suck dick to yes. get to? <laughs> would not target. Yeah, work. Would not suck a dick to get to Fresno. <laughs> I just wouldn't be good. Or call, Kansas. Man. You got to yeah. have standards. Yeah. That's where I I draw the line at Fresno. Yeah, <laughs> and any of the Inland Empire areas. <laughs> Nowhere in the nine hundred nine for yeah. sure. <laughs> So the boys said that Long would quote biblical scripture to justify and support their sexual activity. Allegedly, Long put together elaborate marriage style ceremonies between himself and the boys to further legitimize and establish their relationships. And he is so anti-gay. Right. And he's doing and then marriage using style. using the Bible to child marry these dudes. He was just like anti-gay, championing yep. like anti-gay movement. Like that's so, you didn't want marriage at he's all for so you, evil. You he's fucking so hypocrite. evil. He's so evil. Yep. The ceremonies included decorations, exchange of jewelry, vows, and biblical quotes. It was just exactly like a wedding. It's a fucking wedding. Yeah. Long denied the allegations through his attorneys and spokesmen. In a prepared statement, Long said, I have devoted my life to helping others, and these false allegations hurt me deeply. But my faith is strong, and the truth will emerge. All I ask for is your patience as we continue to categorically deny each and every one of these ugly charges. 
On September 26, after the news of the encounter surfaced, Long spoke to the New Birth Church congregation during a sermon, but he was vague, and he didn't address the issues directly. Long spoke of painful times and painted himself as an underdog, saying, I've been accused. I'm under attack. I want you to know, as I said earlier, I'm not a perfect man, but I'm going to fight this thing. Long's unwillingness to address and deny the accusations specifically prompted a group of over 70 people to hold a protest rally calling for Long's resignation. Yes. Yes, but also, as it said earlier, there were 25,000 people in his church and the protest was 70. See, and that shows how many people are like, no, yeah, he's going to beat this I'm sure he's innocent. Yeah, he would never. Fuck. I mean, I, I'm glad that somebody protested. Of course, it would be worse if nobody yeah, stood no up. Yeah, no one gave a shit. But part of people. me is just like, okay, the percentages on that are just off. Like, you've got That's to think there's more than 70 1%. people that, yeah, it's just, but I'm glad somebody was standing up for it. He's continued to deny the validity of the claims, though he did reveal some details of his relationships with the boys that seemed unusual and unnerving. Bishop Long said in four separate documents that he often encouraged the new birth missionary church members to call him daddy, Yes. but insisted that the term was a sign of respect. Respect this dick. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, daddy. (laughs) It was also found that Eddie would send Jim selfies to the boys and request pictures in return. Oh my God. Yes. He's a creeper. Jim selfies. Yes. (laughs) oh my god Uh, long's lawyer defended the photos calling long a health advocate and weightlifter that was only (laughs) innocently sending the photos who the fuck yeah my pastor sent me gym photos i'd fucking bro social media i don't care at least i could be like oh this fucking asshole is posting shit on instagram but at least that would be up to me to go out and look for that, whereas right. he's sending that directly yes. to these it's boys. It's pointed. It's specific. It's deliberate. Like, that's just, it's awful. His dick is hard. <laughs> His- I mean, the only smart thing about this is he didn't send nudes. Yes. So it was, like, easy for the lawyer and him to deny, but it's still just like, we fucking know, dude. We're not stupid, you asshole. It was just the towel hanging from his dick. Right. Like, <laughs> after gym shower. Yeah, no hands. <laughs> Click. On May 27th, 2011, the sexual coercion lawsuits were settled out of court with undisclosed terms. Though there were only four publicly named plaintiffs in the sexual impropriety lawsuits, the bishop made an undisclosed out-of-court settlement with five individuals. The so there was one additional person that okay. wasn't part of the lawsuits, but he was a victim. Yeah. I just, uh, yeah, that one, like I said, I know that it's not a murder, but it's no. a serious double lives thing. And also because of the, the huge disparity of being a pastor and someone that's trusted and abusing that so much, it just infuriated me and I had to include it. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me, have you seen that documentary about the pastor who would give like... No, but I know what you're talking about. Where, like with the oil, where they would have like the oil jobs or whatever. And then he basically, yeah, that, I remember watching that one. That was a good yeah. one. It's just as fucked, except for I don't think he was making as much money. Right. That's The money aspect of it does add this element that's just so yeah. bad. And it's just, so, it really is such a contrast. They're mm-hmm. complete, like the other ones were opposite. Like they're all smart. And then they do dumb things and right. stuff like that. But this guy is anti-gay and then super gay on the low. To be like, so famously outspoken for it and then yeah. have so many – it's not just like, oh, he had a boyfriend. No. I mean, he was sexually abusing these young people by just making them believe that he was marrying them. Mm-hmm. Like, that's so sad. That's so – and to be one of those boys who – Maybe is or is not gay. We don't know. Like yeah. they could have just been someone that was trying to be with a father figure mm-hmm. and they could be straight. You you don't know. But if you were gay and that's one of your first relationships, quote unquote, mm-hmm. how sad is that? I mean, just yeah. your whole life is, is tainted by this awful father figure that coerced you into these awful things. Yeah. A distrust in adults. Uh, yeah. You're kind of prostituted out. Like yes. you're selling yourself for trips to Kenya. Right. And- whatever that's just it's really just sad. so sad yeah. anyway so yeah. thank you for bearing with me as, as i went through that story even though it wasn't a murder mm-hmm. i appreciate it 
And thanks, you guys, for checking out another episode of Murder Dictionary. Thank you so much. If you want to find us on social media, we are Murder Dictionary on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Backpage. Craigslist. <laughs> Everywhere. Tinder, Grinder. We are in you. Um, <laughs> and we would also really appreciate if you guys could rate, review, and subscribe. That would Ooh. be awesome. And one thing that you could also do to support us is to tell your friends and family and anyone who is a true crime fanatic about our podcast – We'd love to grow our following, and it's one way that you guys could really support us. So thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. Yeah, tell the lady at the grocery store. Just a random person. <laughs> go up to them and be like, yeah. let me tell you about this murder. <laughs> if you want more murder, check out Murder Dictionary. Just, no, just yell Murder Dictionary. <laughs> murder Dictionary. It's <laughs> just, murder. <laughs> stand on a corner and do your Ja Rule impression. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, you guys. Thanks. And now, an ad from Dad. <clears throat> All right, save money on car insurance when you bundle home and auto with Progressive. Can I take these off? All right. What is this? This looks good. Wow. That's well made. Where did you get this? I'm talking to you with the hair. Yeah, where did you get this? It's good stuff. That's solid. That's not veneer. That's solid stuff. Progressive can't save you from becoming your parents, but we can save you money when you bundle home and auto. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company affiliates and other insurers. Discounts not available in all states or situations. And now, a thought from Geico Motorcycle. It took 15 minutes to take a spirit animal quiz online. Please be the cheetah. Please be the cheetah. And learn your animal isn't the cheetah, but the far less appealing blobfish. Oh, come on. To add insult to injury, you could have used those 15 blobfish minutes to switch your motorcycle insurance to GEICO. GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on motorcycle insurance.